good to see all of you because I haven't been on a Zoom with a bunch of kids before and it's a lot of fun to see you. My best friend teaches um, K through 12, uh, K through eighth grade art. So now I can see what she gets to do. So Louise Kessel is my cousin, Louise Omoto Kessel. Our mothers are sisters. And ever since I was a little kid, Louise liked to entertain and tell stories. And she is a professional storyteller. So that means that that's what she does for her job. She gets to go around and tell people stories. And she's amazing. I love people to tell stories. And I love stories. And I love listening to her. So I'm really excited that she was able to come. And so that she can tell us a bunch of stories, I'm going to hand it over to her. So thank you, Louise, for joining us. You are welcome. So where are all of you? I'm going to put you on gallery view on my screen just for a second. So Michael, where on this planet are you? Um, every person that is in this call, except for one person who, I'm, who is not, who I don't know, is going to be in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. Oh, in, actually, everyone here is in Cincinnati proper. As far as I can tell. And Swasti is in Iowa. Iowa. And I'm in North Carolina. And where's the one person that you don't know? Vanessa, you, where are you based? More Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, okay. Hi, so, I'm probably the oldest kid. I'm like 23. <laughs> yeah, we like old kids and the young it, kids. We're, storytelling we're never too time. old. We're never too old for stories. Definitely not. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, one of the things I love about Zoom, because I've been telling stories and teaching on Zoom all summer and all fall, I like seeing the inside of people's houses. One of my friends has a round house, and I got a little tour of his house the other day. I also, I, I like watching people eat their apples, and I like seeing people's babies, baby brothers and sisters, and I love seeing people's pets. <laughs> this, these are the joys of Zoom, and the other joy of Zoom is getting to get together with people that are from so many different places. It's very cool. Oh, I, I do like it when people snuggle up in their blankets for stories, too. You look, you look very cozy, Emery. All right. I'm going to tell you a story first. I'm going to stand up when I tell it. Um, and it's a story that comes from Africa. And Africa is a very, very big, big place with lots of countries and lots of languages and lots of peoples. So I want you to know that this story comes from the Bantu people. This is one of the first stories I ever told. So I've been telling this story maybe for mm, 40 years or something, and I still love it, which is a good thing, a good recommendation for a story if you can still like it after all that time. All right. Once there was a place where a lot of animals lived, and in this place, there had been no rain no rain, no rain. And what this meant was all the plants that needed water to grow and be green, they got all kind of dried up and shriveled up. And what that meant was all the animals that needed those plants so they could eat and grow and be strong, they got very hungry. But right in the middle of this place, there grew a great, big, tall, beautiful tree. And way up there at the top of that tree, there was every kind of fruit you can imagine. Now those animals, of course, they wanted that fruit. They needed it. They were hungry. But they never could get any of the fruit, no matter how hard they tried. And they did try, too. The elephant tried shaking and shaking and shaking that tree, but none of the fruit fell down. The giraffe tried stretching and stretching and stretching her long neck up, but she never could quite stretch it. 
long enough to get any of that fruit. The monkeys tried climbing and climbing and climbing that tree, but they couldn't climb high enough to get any of that fruit. Even the birds tried to fly up to the top of that tree and they couldn't even fly high enough to get any of that fruit. So all of these animals, they came together and they had a big meeting. They talked about it. They said, what are we gonna do? How can we get the fruit down from this tree? And one animal remembered they said, you know, on the other side of this mountain, there lives a very wise old woman. If we send somebody over the mountain to ask her, she's going to know how to get the fruit down from this tree. And everybody agreed this was a good idea. And they looked around and they looked around and they looked around until they saw their friend. The cheetah. They said, cheetah, will you go over the mountain? You can run faster than any of the rest of us. If you go over the mountain, you will be over and back again in no time. And pretty soon we'll have that fruit and we won't be hungry. And the cheetah said, sure, I'll go over the mountain. And so the cheetah started to run up over that mountain. Oh, that cheetah could run. He raced up to the top of that mountain in no time. He was down the other side in less time than that. He got to the house of that wise old woman. And when he got there, <coughs> he knocked on the door. And the door opened. And there was that wise old woman. She said, yes, can I help you? And the cheetah said, <coughs> you can. I need to know how to get the fruit down from the tree in my village. And the wise old woman said, I know that tree. That's a magic tree. And you're going to have to do a little bit of magic yourself if you want the fruit down from that tree. She said, there's a magic word. And the word is, Uwangalema. She said, if you stand underneath that tree and you say that magic word, all of that fruit, it's gonna fall right to you. And the cheetah said, thanks, thanks a lot. And the cheetah started to run back up over that mountain and oh, that cheetah could run. He raced up to the top of that mountain. He was flying down the other side. His feet were pounding. He was picking up speed until he got going so fast he forgot to look where he was going and thwomp, oh, oh. He ran right into a tree, oof. And by the time he got back up onto all four feet again, he wasn't so sure about that word anymore. He got back to the tree in his village and all the animals gathered around and the cheetah stood up and he tried to remember that word he did. He said, But did any of the fruit fall down from that tree? No. And the cheetah had to say, <clears throat> I forgot. And the animals, they had to have another meeting. They all got together again and they talked about it. They said, what are we gonna do now? Who's gonna go over the mountain this time? They looked around, they said, you know, it can't be somebody who forgets things easy. It's okay to be fast, but if you can't remember anything, what good is it? 
and they looked around and they looked around until they saw their friend, the elephant. They said, elephant, will you go over the mountain? You can remember things for a long time. And the elephant said, I guess I could go over the mountain. And the elephant started going up over the mountain. And she wasn't any too slow herself. She was up to the top of the mountain in not too long a time down the other side. Pretty soon after that, she got to the house of that wise old woman. And when she got there, she knocked on the door. And the door opened. And there was that wise old woman. She said, yes, can I help you? And the elephant said, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you can help me all right. I need to know how to get the fruit down from the tree in my village. And the wise old woman said, that's a magic tree. And there's a magic word. And the word is, Uwangalema. If you stand underneath that tree and you say that magic word, all of that fruit, it's going to fall right to you. And the elephant said, thanks. Thanks a lot. And the elephant started to go back up over that mountain. And the whole time that elephant climbed up that mountain, she talked to herself. She said stuff like, yeah. I can't believe this. I can't believe that that cheetah would have forgotten a word like this. I mean, anybody could remember a word like this, please. A baby could remember a word like this. A worm could remember a word like this. Anybody could remember a word like this, yeah. And that elephant complained all the way up to the top of the mountain. And then she started down the other side. Now, it was a long way going over that mountain. And you could believe that that elephant got tired. She did, she got very tired. She sat down beside the trail, said, I think I'll just take a little rest right here and then go on. And she sat down beside the trail and her eyes, <sighs> by the time that elephant opened her eyes again, she wasn't so sure about that word anymore. And she got back to the tree in her village and all the animals gathered around and the elephant looked up and tried to remember that word she did. She said, but did any of the fruit fall down from that tree? No. And the elephant had to say, uh, <clears throat> Uh, I forgot. And the animals, they had to have another meeting. They all got together again and they talked about it. They said, what are we gonna do now? Who will go over the mountain this time? And a very small voice spoke up. Small voice said, I'll go, I'll go over the mountain. And the animals looked around to see who this could be. And it was the turtle. <laughs> they said, turtle, you think you're going over the mountain? Forget about it right now. You are too small. You are too slow. It would take you 10 years to get over that mountain. Not only that, but what makes you think you could remember that magic? 
when elephant couldn't even remember it. But the turtle just said, I think I can do it. I really think I can. I think I can get over that mountain and I think I can remember that magic and I don't see why you don't just give me a chance. And the animal said, turtle, <laughs> you want to go over the mountain, you go right ahead. Go over the mountain 10 times, see if we care. We'll see you in a couple of hundred years. And so the turtle started to go up over that mountain. And it's true, he did not go fast. He just kind of put one foot down. And then the other. And it took him a really, 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 really long time, even to just get up to the top of that mountain, and an even longer time than that to get down the other side. But finally, he did get to the house of that wise old woman. And when he got there, he knocked on the door and the door opened. And there was that wise old woman. She said, yes, can I help you? And the turtle said, you can, you can. I need to know how to get the fruit down from the tree in my village. All the animals are hungry. We need that fruit or, or our children will starve. And the wise old woman said, listen, there's a magic word. And the word is Uwangalema. If you stand underneath that tree and you say that magic word, all of the fruit will fall right to you. And the turtle said, Uwangalema. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And the turtle started going up over that mountain. And every time that turtle put down one foot, he said to himself, Uwangalema. And every time he put down the next foot, he said to himself, Uwangalema, 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 Uwangalema. Uwangalema, Uwangalema, Uwangalema. And that turtle, he kept singing that word over and over and over to himself every step of the way, dancing all the way up to the top of that mountain. And then he started down the other side. Now, you already know it was a long way going over that mountain. And you could believe that that turtle got very tired because he did get very tired. But instead of going to sleep, that turtle just kept right on singing. And it would sound nice if you would do this along with me. You ready? Uangalema, 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 Uangalema. Now there were a lot of things going over this mountain to bump into or trip over or get tangled up in.
But instead of bumping into any of them, instead of tripping over any of them, instead of getting tangled up in any of them, that turtle just kept right on singing. Ready? Uangalema, 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 Uangalema. And that turtle kept on singing all the way back to his village. And when he got there, all the animals gathered around, hungrier than ever. And the turtle looked up and said, what, 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 what? And then he took a deep breath and he sang out, Uangalema. And as soon as he did, all of the fruit from that tree came tumbling down like a gentle rain. And each of those animals picked up their favorite fruits and they ate 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 until they were all filled up. And then they took a look around and found that turtle. They said, uh, turtle, we just wanted to say, well, well, thanks. Thanks for going over that mountain. And thanks for coming back to us. And especially thanks for remembering that word. And can you remember that word? <laughs> All right. You want to go I am not. I can hear you. I can see you saying in Wangalema. And that is awesome. All right. Well, Wangalema. Wangalema. Thank you. Wangalema. <laughs> um, Swasti said before that our moms are sisters and our grandma and grandpa on our mom's side came from Japan. So my grandfather came first, he came to Hawaii, he came to work in the sugarcane and pineapple plantations. And my grandmother came later. She's what historians call a picture bride. She hadn't even met her husband yet when she came on a boat from Japan to Hawaii. Um, but when she got there, they were already married for a year and they had a bunch of kids. And um, my mom was one of the oldest ones and Swasti's mom was uh, a little bit younger and they were raised in Hawaii and in Hawaii, they lived on Mango Street. And on Mango Street. Mango Street. I know, Simon, I love mangoes. They were my favorite fruit when I was a kid, and I still love mangoes. Um, yeah, so they lived right on Mango Street. And on Mango Street, there were kids from Korea and China and the Philippines. There were a lot of families from Japan, which was nice if there was a Japanese holiday, there were plenty of people to celebrate it with. And all of these kids, they went to school together and they shared stuff from their lunch boxes and they taught each other some of their games and songs and dances. So I, I imagine it was a kind of cool place to grow up on Mango Street. Um, my mom and her brothers and sisters would go to the Buddhist temple because they were Buddhist and they would go there for the services, but they would also go there after school. They had kind of an after school program at the Buddhist temple called Japanese school. And there they learned how to read and write Japanese and other things that were special 
about being Japanese. Um, so this next story that I want to tell you is a Buddhist story. And uh, it's a little more of a serious story. Um, so if if it's not your special story, don't worry, there will be some other ones that are a little for younger kids coming in a minute. But this is one of my favorite stories. I love this one. Long ago, the Buddha was born as a friendly little parrot. He delighted in flying among the tangled branches of his forest home. He greeted other creatures with joy. He was glad to be alive and glad to have been given the gift of flight. Well, one day in the parrot's forest home, the sky darkened and without warning, a terrible storm thundered down. The wind howled and whistled, lightning flashed, and one ancient tree burst into flames. The wind blew the sparks everywhere, and pretty soon the whole forest was on fire. And the little parrot, seeing the flames and smoke, he flung himself out into the fury of the storm, calling out to the animals just below, fire, fire run to the river, fire, fire, run to the river. And many of the animals just below heard that call and they made their way to the safety of the river. But there were other animals trapped in the flames and smoke, not knowing which way to run or hide. And so the little parrot, instead of flying off to safety himself, continue to circle over the fire, seeking some means of helping those animals that were still trapped below. Finally, a desperate idea came to him. Darting to the river that flowed along the forest edge, the little parrot dipped his body and wings in that dark water and then he flew back over the fire, which was now raging like an inferno, and dropping down low among the flames, he rapidly shook his wings. The few drops of water still clinging to his wing feathers tumbled down into the fire like little precious jewels. And then the parrot flew back to the river, and again, he dipped his body and wings in that dark water. And again, he flew back over the fire and rapidly shook his wings. Again and again, the little parrot flew from the river to the fire, from the river to the fire, from the river to the fire, until his wings were ragged and greasy and black. His eyes burned like coals. His mind danced like the spinning sparks. His lungs ached from breathing the smoke. And still, that little parrot continued to fly from the river to the fire, from the river to the fire. After all, he said, what can a bird do at a time like this? But fly. So fly I shall and I won't stop if there's even a chance I can save a single life. High above the parrot in the heavenly realms, the gods were relaxing in their palaces of ivory and gold. Between mouthfuls of sweet food, they looked down upon the earth and they saw that little parrot flying to and fro and they laughed out loud. Look at that little bird. Does he think he can put out a fire like that with a few drops of water from his wings? Ha, it's absurd. But one of those gods was strangely moved by what he saw. And so turning himself 
into a golden eagle. He allowed himself to be drawn down into the parrot's fiery path. The parrot was on his way from the river to the fire when a golden eagle appeared above him. Turn around, turn around, little bird, little parrot, get away from that fire, save yourself. But the little parrot just flew on. Little bird, said the golden eagle, stop. Get away from that fire. You can't put out a fire like that with a few drops of water from your wings. But the little parrot just flew steadily on through the flames. I don't need advice like that from a golden eagle, he said. <laughs> Why, I could have had advice like that from my own mother and father long ago. Advice? I don't need advice at all. What I need is for someone to pitch in and help. And the golden eagle, seeing that brave little parrot flying so steadily on through the flames, suddenly felt shame for his own privileged kind. He could hear the Laughter of the gods above while frightened animals cried out just below. And suddenly he didn't want to be a god or a golden eagle or anything else. He, he just wanted to be like that brave little parrot and to help. Moved by these new feelings, the golden eagle began to cry. Streams and streams of shimmering tears cascaded down like a cooling rain on the fire, on the forest, on the animals, on the little parrot himself. Now that's more like it, he said. He rocketed about the sky like a little feathered sun. Teardrops dripped off the charred ends of tree branches and fell to the earth where new grass pushed its way up beside still glowing cinders, leaves unfurled, blossom petals drifted to the forest floor. The animals looked around at one another. All were well and whole. And then they looked up to see their friend the parrot looping and soaring, flying on and on. And they said, hooray, hooray for that brave little parrot and for that sudden miraculous rain. Thank you. Um, so let's see, checking the time and thinking about all of you and I'm, I might be going off my list of stories. Uh, yeah, I think I am. Uh, good to be able to abandon a plan. Um, so I know that several of you go to a Jewish day school, because Michael told me so. Raise your hand if that's you, that you go to the Jewish day school. Yep, 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 yep. All right, so um, this is a Yiddish story. And I learned it from one of my storytelling students and I liked it right away. And it's a fun story to tell because I get to be very grumpy through most of the story. It's good to be grumpy in a story every once in a while. Once there was an old woman by the name of Meshka. And Meshka was the grumpiest, grouchiest, unhappiest old woman that you have ever met in your entire life. She complained about everything from the moment she opened her eyes in the morning till the moment her head hit the pillow at night. Just to give you an example of what a typical day was like for Meshka, one day she went into the village to do some errands and the first person she met 
was the dressmaker. The dressmaker said, Meshka, Meshka, how are your children? Meshka said, oy vey. Now I've got to tell you, there's a lot of oy veys in this story and oy veys are very therapeutic. And I recommend you say them along with me. You'll, you'll catch on. There's a lot of oy veys in this story. So can everybody just practice one time? I'm going to go one, two, three. Oy vey. I can't hear you, of course, but I'm trusting that you're with me. All right. So Meshka said, oy vey. My son, he is so lazy. All he does is lie around and read books like a bump on a kosher pickle. My daughter, you'd think she's forgotten she even has a mama. I'm lucky if I see her once a week. Oy vey. Meshka went on through the village and the next person she met was the grocer. The grocer said, Meshka, Meshka, how is your home? Meshka said, are you ready? Oy vey, my house, if only my late husband had had the foresight to build us a decent place to live in, but no, he built us a little box like the size for crackers. Oy vey. Meshka continued through the village and the next person she met was the rabbi. The rabbi said, Meshka, Meshka, how is your health? She said, oy vey, my back. It feels like I'm carrying the wall of Jericho itself and my feet, look at them. They've swollen to the size of watermelons. Oy vey. Well, Meshka finished her errands she went back home. She went to bed and the next morning when she woke up, she felt a weird kind of tingly, tickly itch on her tongue. Now she had never felt anything like that before. So she rushed to the bathroom and she looked in the mirror, <sighs> but she couldn't see anything unusual. So she went about her usual day. She made breakfast for her son and she called for him down the hall. Breakfast is ready. But of course her son did not answer or come down the hall and she said, Oy vey, that boy, he is so lazy. All he does is lie around reading books like a bump on a kosher pickle. She walked down the hall to get her son to come to breakfast. She opened the door to his room and he was not there. Her son was gone, but in his place, stretched out in his bed, was an enormous kosher pickle with a good sized bump on it. Oy vey, said Meshka, what has become of my son? Oh, oh, this is terrible. Why, why, it shouldn't be too hard to find him in this little box of a house. And as soon as she said those words, her house started to shrink up smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until her head was sticking out the front door and her feet were sticking out the back door and her arms were sticking out the windows. Help, said Meshka, oy vey. She wiggled out of the house and said, what a day I am having. I need to talk to somebody I trust. I think I'll go and see my daughter if she even remembers she has a mama. Meshka made her way through the village to the outskirts where her daughter's house was. She knocked on her daughter's house. Her daughter answered the door and said, yes, old woman, can I help you? Oy vey, said Meshka. Isn't it bad enough that my back feels like I've caught the wall of Jericho on it? My feet have swollen to the size of melons. And as soon as she said these words, 
Her feet really did turn into two enormous watermelons. She lost her balance, fell smack on her face in the road, just in time to see the wall of Jericho flying out of the sky and pinning her to the road. Oy vey, said Meshka. Well, just then, who should come walking down the road but the rabbi? The rabbi said, Meshka, Meshka, what has happened here? And Meshka told him all about her terrible, terrible day. And the rabbi listened very carefully. Meshka, he said when she was done, did you by any chance feel a strange kind of tingly, tickly itch on your tongue this morning? She said, yes, 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 I did. Oh, said the rabbi, I regret to inform you that you have the kvetch's itch. It means that everything that you complain of, and it only happens to people who complain a lot, will come to be just exactly as you have complained of them. Oy vey, said Meshka. You mean all of these things that have happened to me today have happened because of things I myself have said? Precisely, said the rabbi. Oy vey, said Meshka, what's the cure? There is no cure, said the rabbi. You will have this the rest of your life. However, I can say this. If you can learn to praise the things in your life, these problems that you have described to me will cease to... <laughs> Meshka, it was an unfamiliar. Yes, start with your children, said the rabbi. Oh, my son, said Meshka, he is so lazy. No, 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 no. Praise your son, said the rabbi. <clears throat> my son, said Meshka. He reads to gather knowledge. Good, good, said the rabbi, keep going. My daughter, she is very busy with a family of her own and I'm very fortunate that she comes to see me every week. Good, good, said the rabbi, go on. My house, it is snug and well built. Good, said the rabbi, continue. And I'm in pretty good shape for a woman of my years. And as soon as she said these last things, the wall of Jericho flew off her back, her feet shrunk back to her normal size. She got to her feet just in time to see her daughter coming out of her front door. Mama, I was just coming to see you. They walked together to the house, which had resumed its normal size. They walked down the hall to the son's room, and <clears throat> there he was, lying in bed, reading a book with the faint smell of pickle juice in the air. And from then on, every time Meshka was tempted to say, Oy vey, she said instead, <clears throat> My life is good, and I am happy. And soon she was. <laughs> All right, I've got one more story for you. And then if anybody has any questions or responses or anything, I'd be happy to hang out for a minute. Um, this is a Pueblo story and I learned it from the, a book by a storyteller named Joe Hayes. And um, it goes like this. Once 
it didn't rain for a whole year. The grass got all dry and brown and all the leaves fell off the bushes and trees. And down in the canyon where a river usually ran, there was nothing left but a few small puddles. But living in one of those puddles, there was a frog. And the frog could see that his puddle was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And he knew that if his puddle dried up altogether, he would die. But that frog, he knew a rain song. And so he sang to try and bring the rain. He sang, rain, rain, rain. But that one little frog all by himself in a puddle, his song was not that loud. It was not loud enough to go all the way up to the top of the highest mountain, which is where the rain god lived. And so the rain god didn't hear the song and there was no rain. <clears throat> well, living on a dried up bush right beside that puddle, there was a locust. And the locust could tell that if it didn't rain before the end of summer, that she would die. And so she too knew a rain song and she sang to bring the rain. The locust sang, But that one little locust singing all by herself, she didn't make a loud enough song to reach all the way up to the top of the highest mountain where the rain god lived. And when she looked up and saw not a cloud in the sky and no rain coming, she started to cry. <laughs> and the frog, hearing someone crying, hopped over to the edge of his puddle to where the bush was and said, What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? And the locust said, what's the matter? Are you kidding me? It hasn't rained in a year. And if it doesn't rain pretty soon, I'm going to die. That's what's the matter. And the frog realized that he and the locust shared that faith. And when he thought about that, the frog started to cry. And when the frog was crying, the locust felt she had to do something. Frog, frog, she said, hey, listen, I have an idea. When one person works all by themselves, there's only so much they can get done. But when people work together, they can accomplish much more. We should join our songs and sing together. We'll be louder that way. And the frog thought this was a good idea. And so they joined their songs. <laughs> Now the two of them singing together, it was a louder song, but not loud enough to get all the way up to the top of the highest mountain where the rain god lived, but loud enough to get to the next puddle up the canyon. And in the next puddle up the canyon, there was another frog. And when he heard that song, he wanted to join in. And there were locusts around that puddle too. And they started to join in the song as well. And 
with those two frogs and a dozen or so locusts all singing together, they made a song that was loud enough to reach all the way to the other side of the canyon where there were dozens of frogs and hundreds of locusts. And when they all started singing together, it made a big song. And it did reach all the way up to the top of the highest mountain where the rain god lived. And the rain god heard that song. And he gathered the dark clouds together. He made a soft wind begin to blow and quiet at first. The rain started coming until it was raining harder and faster and louder and the thunder rolled and a big storm. The rain came down hard and the river started to run in the canyon again. And a short time after that, beside the canyon, the grass grew green again, the trees got leaves, the bushes got leaves, the whole earth came to life again, all because a frog and a locust worked together. Okay, I want to go in the ball pit. I really do. That looks like fun, fun. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for listening and for showing up. Does anybody have any questions about storytelling or the stories or what I do or anything at all? I have a question. Yes, Emery. Um, were any of these stories true? That is one of my favorite questions. So this is what I learned from another storyteller. I believe, where'd you go, Emery? Oh, there you are, but there you are. Um, I believe that all stories are true, but that some of them didn't really happen. The reason I believe all stories are true is like, let's take the story about Uwangalema. Have you ever gotten going too fast in a big rush and sort of bungled things up? I have. Yeah. So that's the true part of that story. Have you ever complained so much that it just kind of wore you out and made you tired? I have. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the true part of that story. And sometimes if we keep the, 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 best intention in our hearts and we like remember that the reason we want to get over the mountain is because all of our babies are hungry like the turtle just kept that in his mind as he was going over the mountain then we can do a lot more than we think we can or a lot more than we've ever done before maybe so those are sort of the true parts of the story but some of the details maybe did never happen. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. What's the moral of the story? Well, uh, you know, good question. I don't really like to talk about the moral of the story too much myself, but I'd be really interested in what you think. One of the things I like about being a storyteller is like, Sometimes if you're trying to talk somebody into something or have like a debate or an argument with somebody and you're trying to change their mind about something, it doesn't go that well. But if you tell somebody a story, sometimes people's hearts are a little more open. So I don't like to belabor the morals too much because I'm afraid it'll take the magic away from it. But I'm curious what you think. What do you think the moral of the story is? I'm interested. I have a question. Wait a minute, give Michaela a chance. Like, let's say the story about the frog and the locust. What do you think? What's the take home for you for that one? Are you, you're muted in case like, you're trying to Like, what did 
like what did you um what did like what did you learn yeah what did you learn or is there anything uh, um, in your life that you feel like it kind of applies to you Emery, are you trying to talk to us? Because you're muted if you are. I see your mouth moving. Okay. <laughs> Ideas, Michaela? Uh, Not really. Not really? Um, it's sort of like e even like the election we just had. Um, if, if we're just all working by ourselves, that sorry, that was a weird sound because my my phone was making noise. Um, if we're all just working by ourselves, it's hard to have a voice that maybe people can hear. But if you get a bunch of people together, then sometimes people can hear us better. Maybe even if at your school, you thought, you know, too much homework. <laughs> um, and if you just said that to your principal, too much homework, They'd go, yeah, suck it up. That's the way it is. <laughs> but if everybody in your class or everybody in your whole school said, really, too much homework, they might have to stop and listen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah? So that to me is like what the frog and locust story is about. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, Simon. Um, Whatever happened? to the people after the story and Oh, such a good question. I would like you to make up a story and send it to me to answer that question. I would love to hear it. That would be awesome. How many kids are in the ball pit? Yeah. My brother wants to ask a question. Okay. What is your question? What, like, what was this story about? <laughs> well, which, which one? The Jewish one or the or the first one? Or the last one? The last one. The last one? Yeah. I the don't bug. know why she, the, the woman turned into a pickle. The one where people were turning into pickles. He wants you to clarify why she turned into a pickle. Uh-huh. Uh, why the, her son turned into a pickle because she said, he's so lazy, like a bump on a kosher pickle. And it turned out what she said had a magic power that it actually made it so. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Take care. Thank Bye. you, Louise. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. She's got some good stories. Thanks. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Bye.